Good morning, people of St. Paul's. I welcome you in Jesus' name as we continue this Women's Month focus. This morning we welcome Professor Charlene van der Valt of UKZN, working in the area of gender and religion. Over the last numbers of weeks, the issue of gender-based violence has come up in each of our inputs. And so this morning, Prof. Charlene helps us to understand something of the basis of this scourge and how we may respond positively to it. We thank our Ordinan, Sibelum Tumkulu, for arranging this. He himself is a master's student at UKZN. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Professor Charlene van der Valt. I'm based at the University of KwaZulu Natal and I head up a program at the institution that explores the intersection of gender, sexuality and religion. Um, it's a joy for me uh, during Women's Month to share some thoughts and reflections on the impact and the ways in which faith communities inform uh, gender-based violence. I think, however, when we start speaking about issues during, gen during Women's Month, that it's important for us uh, to think of the way in which we speak about women. So often, uh, the, the entire time of Women's Month is taken up by reflections on gender-based violence, and although I think this is deeply important, I think we also need to think and celebrate uh, the agency of women and the myri myriad of ways in which women make sense and meaning of the world and in which women hold community. But uh, now we are reflecting on the pervasive silence of faith communities on the issue of gender-based violence. I think this is one of the biggest standout elements, is the fact that the church does not speak about the issues of gender-based violence. Um, and so often church and faith communities inform uh, the landscape that enables um, gender-based violence in the South African context. I think we, especially during the COVID-19 lockdown, have become really aware of the impact of gender-based violence within our communities, within our faith communities, within our homes, within our families. It's something that we can't uh, escape. And I think um, wherever we meet, wherever we encounter each other, there we encounter the survivors of gender-based violence. And therefore, I think it's an important issue that we need to engage. When we kick off this conversation, we think about uh, the causality, the reasons why gender-based violence is so pervasive in South Africa. I think Professor Rachel Jukes from the Medical Research Council in Pretoria helps us when she says, foundationally, gender-based violence boils down to two ideological factors. The first is a, um, a culture of male dominance, where, where men are somehow uh, valued more, the opinion of men is, is valued uh, more than that of women and secondly a culture of violence where we respond to issues of conflict uh, with violence so gender-based violence um, holds a number of important imperatives for for faith communities and for those we engage with faith uh, very often when when interventions are staged around gender-based violence faith sectors are, are left out of the equation because people think uh, that faith communities are only part of the problem. It's often a sector that, that activists within gender-based violence circles just ignore. Um, but I think it's important for us as African faith communities to start to think about two very important things. And our faith leaders and, and, and leaders in our faith community need to develop skills around language and vocabulary to speak about issues of gender and sexuality. Um, and secondly to develop critical analytical skills, to, to reflect on the reasons why gender-based violence is so pervasive with, within the South African society. Um, I'd like to, to challenge us and, and maybe challenge myself, and, and I have a community of, of scholars and students engaging these ideas, um, about why, why faith communities are really important in this engagement. And I think it's difficult for us to have these conversations because a lot of things that informs gender-based violence is ideas or concepts or theologies that is a great comfort to us and that holds great beauty. But I think it's important that we interrogate these foundational beliefs because it, is, it has an impact on the way 
um, that live, that we live our lives. So firstly, I think we need to think about where our theology starts. Do we, do we start reading the Bible from, from the positions of power? Or do we start thinking about theology and about the way we read the Bible from the bodies of those most affected and from the position of the poor and the marginalized? I don't think we should be surprised by the pervasiveness of patriarchy or the stability um, of the notions of male superiority that Rachel Duke says informs um, uh, gender-based violence in South Africa if we continue to engage our patriarchal foundational text in uncritical ways. The way we read the Bible on a Sunday morning at nine o'clock deeply informs the way that we structure our lives. And if we continue... Uh, to read uh, our foundational text, which is the Bible, that, that's deeply patriarchal in an uncritical way. We shouldn't be surprised that ideas of male superiority and of male headship goes unquestioned. Um, and if we just think about it, the Bible is predominantly uses male language to think about God. If we don't interrogate these ideas, it, it creates a culture of normalcy and stability around male superiority. Um, and because these ideologies has a massive impact for women and the sexual reproductive choices of women, I think it's important that we need to think about who gets to speak around gender-based violence, who holds the power in the process of negotiating sex and sexuality. And maybe for some, this might be a big surprise that we should negotiate sex and sexuality because patriarchy so often informs the constructs and our institutions, for instance, of marriage. And these institutions also warrant interrogation. Uh, beco because beyond individual examples, it is more the institution that we need to reflect on. So, so ideas about the headship of men, or the control of men in the decision-making power, or in the control of men around uh, sexual reproductive health rights and choices. These systems are often informed by toxic theology. Um, and as religious leaders uh, and as people of faith, we need to think about uh, how notions, how ideas like what God put together, no one can pull apart, how those ideas inform ways in which women remain in toxic situations. Thirdly, I think we need to ask serious questions about our understandings and our ideas of suffering and God's role in suffering. So often we glorify suffering. We say, like Jesus has suffered, so we must endure. And this often informs also our pastoral care interventions, the way that we speak to women who are situated within life-denying relationships. And I think we need to think about uh, how, we, how we talk about people who are in vulnerable and, and toxic situation. Uh, so often we say, you should stay because uh, this is what God put apart. How do we think, uh, how do we interrogate these foundational ideas? Fourthly, our ideas around forgiveness. And although I, I think no one who reflects on this video will say it's a bad idea to start processes of forgiveness in your life, I, I however think that the way that the Christian church and faith communities often deal with with um, with forgiveness. Um, it places a very high burden uh, on the survivors of gender-based violence. Our liturgies and services of healing uh, often don't engage the complex notions of power um, and violence when it comes to issues of gender-based violence. Uh, we almost uh, expect of survivors of gender-based violence to to immediately forgive and to move on with their lives. And, it, and that leads to the fact that we're not dealing with the intrinsic trauma that, that realities like this create. We need deep work and thinking about the process of forgiveness, the complexity of victim blaming that we often see, uh, the often invisible nature of men uh, or perpetrators of violence in discussions around, around forgiveness. And how often the burden of healing is placed on the survivor of gender-based violence. Fifthly, I think we need to think about our ideas of shame and sin. How often bodies and sexuality is engaged with the paradigm of sin and shame. 
And this informs a culture of silence. If we can't talk about our embodiment or our sexuality, this keeps us quiet. And, and that informs the way in which we, we don't speak about these things. And finally, I think um, issues of sex and sexuality urges us to reflect on the direction of the way in which we do theology. Do we do theology from the body, from, from this inescapable reality out of which we experience everything? So do we do body theology starting here or theology about the body? And I think this leads us to, to issues that's really important in our reflections on gender-based violence. So often the church comes up with ideas or, or plans or strategies without really sitting with the experiences of those who speak from their embodied position. So I think our great challenge as faith leaders is to create spaces where those affected by gender-based violence can lead the process towards transformation. This is hard because it's difficult to deal with the, the trauma and the pain that people have experienced. It's hard to facilitate those spaces. But the allowing um, the survivors of gender-based violence and hate crime to determine the direction of our conversation is the only way uh, for us to move forward. I think there's a bunch of ways in which faith communities can make a difference and can, can inform the ways in which we engage gender-based violence. Firstly, as I've already said, to allow the survivors of gender-based violence to lead the process of transformation. Secondly, um, and, and we've been part of numerous processes where we embody something of the pain of, of survivors of gender-based violence and where we, where we sit with that traumatic experience as a community. And thirdly, I think we can do much to interrogate the ways in which we read the Bible, the way in which we engage the Bible and the spaces in which we engage the Bible. Because fundamentally, our reading of the Bible should inform life-affirming faith communities and therefore we should sit with the complexity of a text written for men to uphold a community of men. How do we as a faith community grapple with this text if we say that it informs our lives? During this Women's Month I hope that we as faith communities take seriously the cry of those affected by issues of gender-based violence and hate crimes in the South African society. And I hope that rather than thinking that we've got the answers or that we will show the way, that we will be humble and that we'll listen to the plea of those affected by gender-based violence.